So we live in a time in which productivity is something scholarly. It's something that we strive to have, something that we hope to wake up to in the morning, especially if we have a huge load of work that's waiting for us to be finished by the end of the day. And, you know, when you go on YouTube and you go on these all these other internet sources, you see a lot of people giving you tips on how to be more productive, you know, waking up early, making sure that you're swallowing the frog or, you know, making sure you're doing the hard thing first, she said, and just relatively knowing exactly what you need to do to accomplish the day, to check off all those things on your checklist or to-do list, and knowing that you did a good job, and then sleep, and then repeat. Now... The thing is, you're probably in a circumstance in which you wish you had more productivity. You wish that you checked off more things off your to-do list. You wish you could finish a to-do list. You probably have like 20 plus tabs open in your laptop right now on a browser. And you're probably thinking, how can I fix my sleep schedule? Dang, I only slept like three hours last night because I was too busy playing Zelda. And that's a real thing. And there are people out there, myself included. I have 20 tabs open in my Safari or Chrome or whatever browser that you use at a time because there are a lot of videos I keep on the back burner. And there's a lot of projects I keep in the back burner. And, you know, it. there are some parts of it that derail you from actually finishing the thing that you do need to have done, the projects that you do need to have finished by a certain date. And to be able to reach those those due dates that you set for yourself or even set by your employer. And I'm just here to tell you that it's completely normal to be derailed or, you know, procrastinate in general. Your mind is kind of developed in a way you can do multiple things at a, a certain time. You can think multiple thoughts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of those thoughts or the quality of which you think about these things is going to be top tier, right? Like you can't just be cooking and then reading a book and expect your cooking to be as good as if you were to focus in on the cooking itself and not be distracted by anything else. And distractions come and go. And like we've talked about in previous episodes, distractions are everywhere. It's literally everywhere. And it doesn't even mean just your phone ringing. It can also just be a thought that comes to mind that kind of detracts you from what's going on and focusing in on what's in front of you. You can think about like, you know, while you're studying, like, oh my God, what am I going to, what am I going to eat for dinner? You know, and especially if you're in college, that's very relatable. You you have to think for yourself. You need to think on your feet. And as we kind of realize and build this awareness in the beginning, we're realizing, wait a minute, how can I be more productive? How do people stay productive? And of course, you go, lo and behold, onto YouTube. And you find these YouTubers like Ali Abdal, Matt Diavella, who, you know, I aspire to be hopefully one day. But, you know, they give you tips uh, and tricks and how to try these things. And you've tried many different things that they've suggested, and none of them really hit, right? Like meditation, journaling, a lot of the habits in which they promote are really hard to actually implement consistently. It's, It's really difficult because, you know, something like journaling, for instance, if you're not into journaling, and then you start diving into the deep end and journaling every day, you kind of find it difficult. The obstacle itself of journaling is hard to acquire the habit itself than you think. It takes many, many weeks, if not months, to actually feel like it's second nature, right? And, you know, you're not lazy as a person. You're not a lazy human being, right? We're all, we all have the bouts in which we have no motivation, we have no willpower, as some people say, and it's not your fault, right? That, again, this is like a very common theme now in the past couple episodes that it's, it's really not your fault that you're procrastinating, you're being lazy, whatever you call yourself in a negative way, it's not helping first off calling yourself lazy or just like just an unsuccessful person in general. You have the power to be as successful as you want to be. It's just knowing the right tools and the right methods in a way that will bring you closer to whatever goal that you envision for yourself or whatsoever. Now, I have three tips here, you know, just like a Ned's Declassify episode that can potentially help you in terms of bringing you closer to your goals, hopefully, but also adopting methods and, you know, practices in which will bring you closer to wherever you want to be in life and hopefully um, will make the journey to whatever success story that you're going for or want to write in the near future, hopefully in the near future, it will seem less daunting. So... 
the first tip I have for you, and this is one that I feel like a lot of YouTubers and a lot of self-help, self-development, productivity gurus, and whatever you want to call them, are not promoting as often. Like we said, they talk about meditation, they talk about journaling. There are all these things that kind of become recurring themes across videos. But the one thing that is extremely rare that I think I found in a Thomas Frank video that really has impacted me since I think my first year or second year in college is that your environment plays a role in whatever you're doing, right? If you are studying, so let me let me put this in layman's terms. If you're studying in the same place in which you play video games or watch TV, it's not gonna be as productive if you have a set environment to study and a separate, separate environment in which you play games and watch TV, right? Sitting on the sofa and studying is not gonna be as productive as if you were to sit in another corner of your room to be studying something uh, that really d needs your attention. So ideally, you have to identify those places in which your basically your attention is divided. And it's very easy to identify those places. Now, the second step is identifying a place in which you think you can have your attention not divided. A lot of people, I kid you not, uh, this is a common trend in entrepreneurs and stuff, is that they're converting their closets into office spaces. And why is that? <laughs> it's pretty funny. But why is it that this is a trend? It's because when you're in the closet, there's literally nothing to distract you. It's actually a really scary place, especially if you're in hide and seek and you hide in the closet. It's, it's, it's kind of scary. It's a place in which there are no distractions. It's actually, you know, in terms of sound, it's insulated enough that there probably is not going to be <laughs> a lot of sound going into the closet and you'll have that privacy to think, right? It's really scary to sit with one's thoughts, which we covered in the last episode. And that's exactly what you need. You kind of have to sit with your thoughts. And especially if you're in need of doing a certain type of work or a task that's really daunting at first, you just have to, there's really no avoiding doing the thing, doing the task. So finding an environment in which you can have an undivided attention and also like you condition your mind to do a particular task in this environment really, really helps and will actually bolster your your need to take action on a given task or any sort of thing that you, you know, want to accomplish for the day. So like we said in the beginning of this tip, which is your environment does matter. Ideally, you want a space for certain tasks. So this is a place where you eat. This is a place where, or sorry, this is a place where you eat and maybe like, you know, have lunch or dinner and like you watch TV or play video games there, like the living room, right? That living room is an inter entertainment space. So keep it an entertainment space. Respect the space enough and respect yourself enough to identify that as the entertainment space. Now, if you are studying, if you are working, especially if you're working from home, like a lot of us, then ideally you don't want to, you know, as they say, poop where you, you know, poop where you sleep. Like you don't want to cross these two worlds. I know multiverse is a big thing now, but you do not want to cross these two environments because your mind is set in the entertainment lounge to be entertained. It's not set to be a place to work because if you're sitting in the spot where you eat and play video games, then your mind is going to expect yourself to eat and play video games now, right? Not work. So ideally do not mix the two environments. Maybe there is a separate room. Maybe there is an office or even a closet in which you can work. Hopefully there's lighting in there uh, in which you can really focus in on and condition your mind because it does take time to deliberately start doing the thing in which you consistently do, let's say a task or you do most of what your work in, requires you to do in the closet or maybe uh, like in a separate room or whatsoever, but make sure you're not mixing it up with different environments, right? You're not like making sure that you're not working where you're eating or where you're usually uh, entertained, essentially, like the living room. Now, there is a caveat to this rule of having separate environments. You can have multiple environments for anything, right? So let's say like I had a friend who had a PlayStation downstairs and then he also had his gaming PC upstairs. So that's two separate areas in which he is entertained. He is gaming in two separate areas, not simultaneously because that'd be crazy, but he has two separate areas for a given task, which is to entertain himself. Now, this also applies to work. And this is the thing that really, really gets a lot of people is that as creatures of novelty, 
we seek and we ideally want to gravitate towards something that feels new, that makes us feel refreshed and like like a new coat of paint really makes a room feel different, right? And like I read somewhere like people were, were suggesting, especially those that were like investment bankers that were you know, burnt out by the mid middle of the day to like change their socks because it just makes them feel like a new person. Uh, you know, I've never, <laughs> I've never done that. I mean, you could do that if you want. It's, it's really strange, but taking the lesson from that, having separate environments, but you can have the multiple, multiple of the same environment for a given task. Let's say you don't have to stay in the closet for your work for the entire day. It's, it's going to be really daunting to be staying in there for a majority of the day. Maybe there is a separate room. Maybe you can use the guest room in your house or maybe like a corner of your apartment in which you can dedicate to work as well. Like you can have multiple working environments. And it's really important that you know when your brain is kind of getting tired and switching up the you know, positioning or the place in which you're in um, to work. Let's just say like I have two separate work environments. I have my bedroom, which is, you know, a very solid place to work at because even though your bed is there, try to not look at your bed because, you know, just reminding yourself. Uh, I know we said don't mix up, you know, where you're where you're doing certain tasks, but sometimes they kind of converge and it's best to just train yourself not to, or, you know, train yourself not to look at the bed. But you know, Ernest Hemingway had a bedroom that he worked in ideally for his writing. But let's just say I work in my bedroom and I, I do, I mean, as you can tell, I do most of the podcasts in this bedroom because it's a very insulated environment. It's where, you know, I've, I've already conditioned myself to doing these podcasts. And then let's say like I can feel myself wearing down mentally and physically and I just need a, you know, a novel environment. I need like a new place to work. So I have very different working environments. Let's say I record the podcast here. I'm putting all, my all into this, giving you tips and talking into the microphone. But then when I'm editing and stuff, I usually go into the guest room or whatever, uh, like a, even in just like a separate corner of the same room, it just feels like an entirely new refreshing experience because you're not just like in the same position with the same view, whatever. I also had a friend in college who every hour, if he had a very long stretch of the day, he would ideally move to separate libraries. I know it sounds like a hassle, but each time he moved to a new library, he was actually refreshed uh, you know, vitally just because of just the different environments that he was experiencing. And luckily enough, you know, when you go to college, usually there is a coffee shop or whatever shop is there for like snacks and re-energizing treats, uh, at every library or every like study space. So understanding that you can have more than one environment for, you know, a specific type of task or a specific type of entertainment, that's completely fine. And like I said, like you don't have to have a huge, huge mansion to have like different rooms for each individual task, like one for TV, one for entertainment, like, you know, playing games, one for studying. You can even move around in the same given room and it will feel refreshing. I know it sounds weird, but you can try to attempt it even just moving in a separate corner of the room. Ideally, don't do work on your bed, right? Like bed is for sleeping. That is just a constant. That should always be the thing. That's why they always say don't bring your phone into bed or anything like that is a place to sleep and to be alone with your thoughts, as scary as it may sound. But moving around to different environments and conditioning your brain, right? Training your brain to do that given task in those environments really, really helps and will be beneficial for your procrastination problem, as you say, or or laziness, however you deem it. But knowing that you can actually have like some sort of re-energizer just by moving to a separate place would hopefully benefit you in the long run. Now, the second one, this is the part where I bring up a book. And this book is really, really interesting. And I didn't even realize that um, who this person was that was writing it. I did find this book extremely inspirational, let alone, it, it was very eye-opening. And it's called The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasin. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, but this book is written and you can say, you can say that it's pretty simple. Like the title already tells you what to do. Like the one thing, like to, to distill your bigger tasks into smaller ones. But it really, if you read the book, it actually kind of shifts your perspective into an idea that, Rather than saying like, okay, this is my big task. Okay, this is the, you know, dilutes into 
uh, separate subtasks, and this is the one thing I need to be done today to finish at least one of those subtasks and at least bring me closer to that bigger goal. Now, it does sound simple, yes, but the daunting, really scary question that actually promotes is what is that one thing that you have to do today? What is that one thing that you have to do this week? What is this one thing that you have to do this month to get you closer to your five year, your 10 year, even your annual goal, whatever you set for yourself? And it promotes the idea of you have to take the first step. But before you take that first step, ask yourself what step in which direction do you need to take to get you closer to whoever you want to be or whatever you envision yourself completing a task. Ideally, you want to cross that off of your goals, you know, because because you've accomplished it or even just taking something, taking something off of your to do list. Right. So this book, even though it kind of tells you in the title, The One Thing by Gary Keller, what exactly it's going to talk about, it helps you put into perspective what is essential. And it's something that we talked about in a previous episode, an idea called essentialism which is basically cutting out all the rest, Marie Kondoing all of your priorities and figuring out what is the one thing, the one priority that you can get done today. And that doesn't necessarily have to be just in this, you know, talking about work. Sorry, I just had a brain fart for a second. But it doesn't necessarily just have to be work related. It doesn't have to be, oh, I have to finish this. I have to finish this uh, review or this revision today. Like, your one thing can be something that really means something to you. So a lot of what I've been reading a lot of and watching videos of entrepreneurs and stuff, I don't know why I'm watching so many of them, but it seems like their one thing for the day is to spend time with their family because being an entrepreneur and being a lot of these, uh, wearing so many hats, as they say, it, it takes a lot of life out of them. It takes a lot of energy out of them and a lot of them start to realize very early on and sadly a a few of them realizing really later on that they really need to spend time with their family. They realize that it's only so long this window in which you can be your child's best friend is so short before they just want to move on to other friends and they just like have those like grungy teenage years, right? So focusing on on the focusing question. So I'm kind of giving away the main cell of this book. I apologize to Gary Keller, but I do recommend that you read the book in its entirety because it's really it really does shift the way that you think about what is essential to you. And it actually teaches you actionable plans in which you can figure out what that one thing is and kind of segmenting it in a proper way in which you can do the one thing now, what's the one thing that you can accomplish this week, what's the one thing you can accomplish this month, and just figuring out from there. But all you have to do is just figure out what you need to do right now in this given moment. Now, the whole thing revolves around this thing called the focusing question, which is the main question you need to ask yourself right now, especially even before you start doing work in the day, right? Like Benjamin Franklin, when he woke up, he said, what good shall I do today? So he identified what he needs to get done for the day to promote that good. And then he has a self-reflection at the end. The focusing question is, what is the one thing such that by doing, everything else will be made easier and or unnecessary? Meaning, what is it that you need to do at this given moment? What is the one thing? Like, forget everything else. Forget all the other distractions. What is the one thing that you want to promote for yourself that will bring you closer into who you want to become in the very, very, very near future by just taking that one step and ignoring the entire journey, right? Like the thought of the journey, just how crazy and scary it is knowing how many miles you have to go. It's not going to matter if you're not going to take the first step, which is, you know, relative to the ancient proverb, a journey of a thousand miles starts with uh, with the first step. What is the one thing such that by doing everything else is made easier or unnecessary. That's something you have to ask yourself. And right, this is this concept of essentialism is supposed to mitigate or control your fear of the outcome. We've talked about how the journey itself is really important, more important than the actual destination that you have set for yourself. And there is no way that you can outcompete this idea of romanticizing the destination without giving much thought into the journey. And the journey starts with that one thing. What is the one thing that you need to get done today? Whether it's saying, you know, 
I know one person told me that like there was a habit they were trying to build is to give at least one compliment to one person, a stranger ideally, a day because they grew up in a household where they were not used to compliments and they want to change their character and they wanted to actually, you know, promote a persona. They want to promote a character in themselves that they've never really received in their life and hopefully, you know, build up that habit. So your journey doesn't have to be as daunting as it may seem, right? Like if you want to be, you know, a writer, you have to start writing, you have to do a chapter, you want to do like a chapter book. So you have to do 70 chapters, you have to do, you know, 400 pages of writing is very daunting. But if you focus in on what do you need to get done today, let's just say you write a page a day, right? Let's say it's a 300 page, 300 page book. If you write a single page a day, you're going to get there before the end of the a, like a year, right? So focus in on what you need to get done today. What is that one thing that you need to do? And again, this is temporal. So you have temporal goals. So you have what can you do today? What can you do this week? And I mean, they all feed into each other. What you can do today, this week, this month, whatever, so be it. As long as you're doing that one thing and you're you know having that one thing uh, for the day, then at least you can say that you made today a success. So even just get, being kind to yourself can be a one thing. And this feeds into, again, the concept of essentialism, which is a book in itself by Greg McCohen. Uh, so this is book that I'm talking about is The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. And this is really rele- relevant to, excuse me, very relevant to make time. Uh, I forgot the author's name, but we've talked about it in the past episode. So those three books, uh, Essentialism, The One Thing, and Make Time, we are going to talk about in a future episode in regards to what essentialism means. But the main point, the main tip, tip number two, which is the focusing question, what is the one thing such that by doing everything else is made easier and or unnecessary will help you take the first step, hopefully. And rather than, you know, this big assignment that you're given in school or something, at least you can know what is the first step that you need to take, whether that just be writing the first paragraph for the day, you know, or, you know, make sure that you're segmenting it properly, not making writing the first paragraph all the way to the last, the day before it's due, but making sure that you know exactly what that time window looks like and segmenting it properly and organizing it properly. So now tip number three, we finally reached the final tip. I'm sorry, we, we've talked so long, I, or I feel like we've talked so long. Number three, again, is a tip. Ideally, I wanna give you tips in which you rarely hear of again you probably heard of these tips before but you rarely hear them so not meditation not journaling uh not cold showers all those things that you hear about product from productivity gurus whatever the third thing that's really important that i think i really promote to pretty much everyone that you know is struggling uh with procrastination and laziness and productivity in general and this has really helped me in the long run since college actually and most of the my college is just realizing myself and what i want because you're away from your parents for the first time number three is knowing how to reward yourself better what does that mean rewarding yourself better if you keep pushing the finish line further and further let's say that like i am going to you know finally get that ice cream when i finish this entire you know, five day research paper. Do you think that you would have motivation enough for a single ice cream for entire five day worth research paper to keep you motivated through the entire journey? Probably not. Probably not. So knowing how to reward yourself better requires you a a little requires a little bit more effort. You have to assess the weight of a given goal. Let's just say you have that research paper that may take a minimum of five days. But the second part is what is the proper reward relative to that weight? So a single ice cream, in my opinion, my opinion, is not a proper reward for finishing a five-day project research paper, right? Now, using and utilizing the second tip, which is what is the one thing, right? The focusing question. If you reward yourself throughout this journey of completion, right? You're, you have these, this big overarching project. 
you turn into smaller objectives in which you need to complete it, right? Let's just say research this, uh, input this, whatever. And then you have, finally, what is the one thing you can do right now to bring you closer to that and complete those things? Knowing that you have a reward for yourself when you comp upon completing those things will help with your motivation, will help with just conditioning yourself or training yourself to keep going, right? I don't know if you've seen those pictures before. There are some weird pictures on Twitter. That's an understatement. But there was this picture that I saw um, by this entrepreneur who is trying to promote education. And she showed a picture that she was like teaching her son how to, you know, to read chapter books. And at the end of each page, she put like a gummy bear. And she said, this is how you gamify, uh, this is how you gamify accomplishments. So why did you put gummy bears there? Because at the end of each page in which her child finished, he finally got a gummy bear and that was his favorite candy. You can do something similar, right? Those little subtasks, every time you complete them, assess the weight of this task that you completed and write down, right? As you're right, so as you're writing down these subtasks, it's always important to write down what are you going to get out of it, you know, after completing it, right? So I started writing the subtasks in which I need to do with attached to the respective reward that I'm going to give myself if I were to complete them. So, you know, as you're an adult and you don't have to have anything due anymore and stuff like that, let's just say, you know, at the beginning of 2022 and 2020, 2021, I want to start reading more, right? So what I did is rather than just saying, oh, I'm going to read 30 minutes a day. It's really hard. And there's like nothing at the end of the tunnel for me. I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to read. And yeah, sure. I read 30 minutes and maybe, you know, most times I didn't. I realized that I didn't really have any reward for doing it, right? And what I did is every 30 minutes that I read, let's just say I can watch an episode of Big Bang Theory, which is an equal 30 minutes, if not less. So there is a reward waiting at the end of each thing that you envision for yourself or task that you have. Now, what I mean is that you have to assess the weight of the given task is that if you read for 30 minutes, that doesn't mean you get to play Zelda for five hours, right? That doesn't doesn't necessarily. The same thing with the first example. When you have a five day long research paper and having a single ice cream, is that really, do you think that's enough? For me with a sweet tooth, I don't think that's enough for a five day research paper. That sounds like a hassle. Why not have a reward at the end of each day that you complete your one thing? Let's just say you have hopefully not an ice cream a day, but like things that you can think of that maybe treat yourself out to a movie or maybe just like, yeah, like maybe eat that little snack. It's okay to eat junk food once in a while, but maybe not make it consistent. Like I said, like this wasn't even food related in which I was reading 30 minutes a day and I was watching Big Bang Theory, right? I, I watched an episode at the end of each 30 minute session of reading. So knowing exactly as you're writing down, people, most people make the mistake of just writing down the task and just like, all right, let's do it. But don't really think of the momentum that you're building as you're completing these subtasks that will lead to the bigger task at hand. When you have a subtask, write down what your reward is at the end of completing that subtask because it really helps your brain think that they have something, they have something to strive towards, right? Like it's always good to have some sort of thing to look forward to. Like they say, like when you're planning out your, your life, always plan out your days off first because it gives yourself something to look forward to. And your smaller tasks in life are no different. You should reward yourself in accordance to the weight or the intensity of a task that you've been doing. And don't go overboard, right? Like we said, like a 30 minute reading session doesn't is not equivalent to a six hour or five hour gaming session, right? Like this does not make sense. So whatever makes sense to you, right? Like if, if you think this five, five day research paper that you finally finished, you finally accomplished, make sure to reward yourself in some sort of way that is equivalent to the weight of that five day research paper that you think or deem is, is, um, is really worthy of, uh, uh, of earning, right? So having something to strive towards really helps in terms of the momentum that you build to get on that journey, right? Like as you take that first step, you want to take the second step, third step, fourth step, but you have to some, have something to kind of uh, entice your brain, like a carrot in front of your brain to kind of keep stringing along. And having those smaller, smaller rewards really helps. And again, don't go overboard. Like don't, don't be like, 
gnawing down some junk food all the time. But I'm just saying that like there are other ways to entertain yourself and to find enjoyment in that doesn't have to be necessarily junk food. It can be just watching an episode of your favorite show, right? Like a lot of shows are just 30 minutes. So knowing exactly how to identify those things can be really helpful in terms of your uh, motivation procrastination. Now, I know I said three, but I'm going to throw in a bonus one just for you. You're welcome. No, I'm just kidding. I I don't like saying that anymore. like saying uh, you're welcome, but no one says it. Well, anyways, here's a bonus one for you is to be kinder to yourself if you do stray away from the path. A lot of us, when we do not accomplish, we don't check off everything on our to-do list, we beat ourselves up. You're probably beating yourself up right now by procrastinating, by listening to this episode uh, in whatever you're doing, rather than doing the work that you need to be doing in this. And I thank you, first off. But second off, go do the thing. Go do the work. But do not beat yourself up if you stray away from a lot of this, right? Like maybe you didn't reach the goal of the day. Maybe you didn't do the one thing because life got in the way. Life gets in the way. That is in a, that is a piece of advice that was given me so late in life. Life gets in the way and it's okay, So be kinder to yourself in all that you do, because if you're not kind to yourself, how can you expect to be kind to others? First off. Second off, how do you expect yourself to recover properly if you're beating yourself up so senselessly mentally? He's like, ah, you, you know, you darn you. Why did you wake up at 12 p.m. today? Blah, blah, blah. You will stray. You, You will get off the path once in a while. That's inevitable. But rather than beating yourself up, realize that these things will happen because a lot of people go into the journeys thinking that won't happen to them, that they're invincible, that they're bulletproof. No, you will stray away from the path. You will you'll have a misstep. But see them as tests, as trials in which you can utilize and you can promote yourself and redirect yourself back onto the path rather than beating yourself up and using that time in which you can you could have redirected yourself back onto the path into beating yourself up for no senseless reason. So be kind to yourself through this journey. This journey is really important for you. Productivity, because you, I ideally, you know, I really want what's best for you. I really, <laughs> I don't, it's weird. It's, I don't like saying it. It's weird saying that. But I do want what's best for you. I do want you to be the best version of yourself that you can be. That's why this whole podcast exists is to help you raise questions that you probably wouldn't have raised in the first place or to come to realizations or you know tips in which you wouldn't have come across in your day to day so be kind to yourself in this journey you are going to experience obstacles but the obstacle is the way as ryan holiday says embracing the fact that there will be obstacles helps with the entire journey the full length of the journey be kind to yourself so the, the, let's go over the tips real quick First tip, the environment. Have a separate environment for different tasks. Do not study or do work in the same place in which you game, you watch movies, whatever. Make sure you have separate working environments. Now, the little sub caveat of that is that you can have multiple environments to do these said things. You can have more than one working environment and you don't have to have a big house. You can have a small apartment. Even moving within the same room can really refresh your mind and really keep you up on that momentum that you need to accomplish the task that you need for the day. Now, the second tip is the focusing question that's introduced by the book, The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasin, which is what is the one thing that such by doing, everything is made easier and or unnecessary. Now, that one thing can be today, that one thing that you need to get done today, such that by doing blah, blah, blah. What is the one thing that needs to be done this week, this month, whatever, but start with what is the one thing that I can do today such that by doing, everything else is made unnecessary and or easy. And again, the reason why this focusing question is on this list in the first place is to Try to control the fear that you have of the entire journey. Learning a programming language is a scary thing, but just inputting that Hello World project for the first time and how you feel doing that will help promote and motivate you to do the next project and the next project and the next project. So it helps make the journey 
and the the way to the destination itself seem less scary, right? It's like that path full of like, you know, like there's one path that's really sunny, that's really nice, and then like you look on the other side, and it's like really really dark. There's crows everywhere, or just random clouds, and make it just seem lower, more gloomy. And that's the path you really need to take, and just to make it less daunting for you, take one step at a time. Number three, know how to reward yourself better. So every time you write a task, no matter how small it is, always associate it and attach a reward to it. What can you reward yourself for 30 minutes of reading? Maybe an episode of your favorite show that's also 30 minutes. That's equivalent. So it's a one-on-one ratio. Knowing how to reward yourself better will help with your momentum moving forward because, you know, without a momentum, we wouldn't even be moving forward in the first place because it'll feel good taking that first step, reward, second step, reward, but knowing how to assess those tasks and the equal weight in which the reward can come, right? Like knowing that 30 minutes of reading is not equivalent to five, like three movies that you can watch in a row. Like knowing that and building that skill is really important, especially if you're in like just in, just navigating life. Like you're, you're figuring out that like it's hard to be consistent. It helps with the consistency. And the bonus tip is to be kind to yourself. And, you know, just like Harry Styles says, you know, treat people with kindness. You have to treat yourself with kindness before you start treating other people with kindness. So you will experience obstacles. There will be times in which you do not want to get out of bed. There will be times in which, you know, you do not reach the one thing that you wrote out for yourself in the first or the second tip. And there will be those days. But rather than thinking that you are going on this journey, bulletproof, invincible, know that you will experience obstacles. And these obstacles are just tests to see if you're going to redirect yourself back onto the path that you wrote out for yourself in the very beginning when you had all that motivation, that peak, that peak. It's called the dip, right? You have that peak in which you have high motivation. You're going to start that course. You're going to you go on that course, Sarah, you're going to finish it. But then like after day three, four, you're in the dip. You're like, you have no motivation. You're like, ah, do I really want to do this? You start questioning yourself, all that stuff. The Dip by Seth Godin is also a great book. You will experience that dip. But if you imagine you're on the top of a mountain, all that potential energy, you don't stay at the bottom, right? Like it's going to, all that potential energy, it's going to use its kinetic energy, go down, and then you're going to come back up. But you have to allow yourself to not stop. You have to keep going. Remotivate yourself in some sort of way. Assess what rewards you're giving yourself, whatever it so be it, because everyone's very, very different. Everyone has momentum, influencers at different levels. So be kind to yourself at the end of the day, because none of this, none of this is going to matter if you are not kind with yourself, embracing that you're going to, the fact that you're going to experience these obstacles because you or her one person We are all just individual people trying to make the best out of this life. You are no different, but you are different in a way, right? So be kind to yourself. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you did, make sure to follow on Spotify. And if it's really impactful, do share it with someone because I try to make it as, you know, constructive as possible for the general public. I know it's not as niche as I would like it. I'm kind of developing this plan in which it can feel more niche and um, cater to your needs as much as it can. So, yeah, yeah, be kind to yourself. That's the main takeaway of this entire thing. Productivity is not going to matter if you're just beating yourself up um, about the littlest things. I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for tuning into the Sarcastically Optimistic podcast. There is a new episode every Monday. If you're listening to this on Monday, I love you very much. Thank you. But if you're on the toilet, in the shower, you know... um, in the car, going on a run, uh, or even just listening to this rather than working on the thing that you need to, the one thing. I thank you. I thank you for being here. Um, I really hope this was helpful. Follow on YouTube because Sarcastically Optimistic is on YouTube. Uh, But most importantly, do ring the bell so you can be notified when the latest episodes are out and whether that be on Spotify and whatever. And yeah, I really hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you have a great week, great day, whatever it so be it. That one thing, what is that one thing? Love you guys so much. I'll catch you on the other side. Goodbye.